Welcome back to JB Squared. I'm JB Hager, along with Johan Bernil, and a, uh, I hate to get ahead of myself, but a historic time trial in the Tour de France we saw today on stage 16. Uh, we'll get Johan's thoughts on the time trial today and his outlook on uh, the top two G GC cont contenders and see what he thinks, where they at, or the, where they are in their head game, and, and then wow, what's going to happen tomorrow. We'll get into all that on this episode of JB Squared. All right, Johan, let's start with with the obvious. Uh, just one of the most dominating performances we've seen in a GC battle in the Tour de France. Like, I don't even know if I want to quiz you to, to say when's the last time you saw something like that. Let's just let it live on its own. But wow, what a performance yeah, well, I, by Eunice Van Gogh. I, I think what's an amazing performance, uh, what I think what everybody has surprised so much is, you know, they have been so tight until now, right? So close. And, and it's difficult to say that today Pogacar didn't do a good time trial. I mean, for, he was second. He put a minute 15 or so in Wout van Aert, who was going full gas for the win. But yet he loses... One minute thirty eight on Jonas Vingegaard. I mean, I honestly, I have to be honest, I didn't see that coming at all. That I, th kind of I difference. thought it would be inside of twenty seconds difference. Yeah, at the yeah most. me too, me too. But you could see clearly, JB, that um, from the start and from going off the ramp, there was a different vibe about those two guys. If you look at uh, Pogacar starting, uh, you know, he he started, looked okay, you know, like straight away in the in the in the arrow bars, and but then you see Vingegaard starting, and that's like a different animal on a bike. Uh, I timed it, and after 19 seconds to the first to the first corner, he was all he was already almost two seconds faster than uh, his rival Pogacar, you know, and that got that kept going on and after 7k the first split he was 20 seconds faster so from there on you could say wow you know to turn this around they either have to stay equal now and then Pogacar would have to have a great climb on the at the end and Vingegaard not such a great climb but at the bottom of the climb it was 50 seconds it was 50 seconds so um Vingegaard was riding like a man possessed today he was he was um completely like Eyes on the prize, just going. His his corners were aggressive. You know, yeah, that, whereas... that's what that's what I noticed. I, I I'm a big motorsports fan. I love watching you know F1 especially, and and I've also done a lot of driving schools. Like his lines were perfection, and and yeah. and, and maybe you can tell our listeners. I was I was talking with Colton, one of our other producers, who you've heard us reference quite often. He's just started riding bikes. And I was telling him this morning, I'm like, I I can't even explain to you how hard it is to go at those speeds in a time trial position and how vulnerable oh. you are. The tiniest bump yeah. at the right the wrong time in a corner, you're done. And maybe you can yeah. elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, a time trial bike handles differently than a road bike. A road bike, first of all, the guys spend a lot of time on it. It's their you know, their second nature, their natural habitat, right? They spend hours and hours. Time trial bike is different. You're, it's a more aggressive position. And on top of that, when you look at the position, of, you know, and stability on a time trial bike, they are, they are like this. So very narrow, uh, but also, you know, the balance is, is, is different. So to be able to corner uh, the way Jonas did it, um, and while descending, you don't always see that in a in a Tour de France time trial with being arrow and descending on corners. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they knew the course to perfection. You know, both of them for sure. They've done it a few months ago already, reckoning it. Uh, then they did it yesterday and on the on the rest day. They probably did parts of it in the morning again. So. Um, the, the course had no secrets for any of both, but it just looked it, the the energy that Vingegaard was transmitting was different than the energy of Pogacar. Uh, Pogacar looked he looked okay on the bike, but it was like more uh, I'm not going to say relaxed, but more like 
everything in control, but not 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 nothing aggressive about his style. And uh, and I think that's that was the whole. I mean, not just the style, the power. Obviously, you know, you can you can be technically perfect, but if you don't have the power in the legs, there's nothing you can do. So Jonas was today in in a league of his own, uh, which you know is a surprise to to. Uh, first of all, I think it's a huge surprise to Pogacar and to his team. I mean, I saw interviews of Pogacar and of his team director, and they said, well, you know, we, you know, we. We did okay, you know. Pogacar said he didn't have a great day, but not a bad day. Uh, and that he was surprised about the time differences. So, you know, if you look four oh, four kilometer four four seconds per kilometer difference over 22 and a half kilometers, I read a stat somewhere. It is since 1961 when the great master time trialist Jacques Anquetil winner of five Tour de France. Uh, I don't remember how much the split was there, but I think he 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 won like with two minutes 30 over the second in a 27, 28 kilometer time trial. Um, but this is, in modern cycling, this is the biggest difference per kilometer um, on, uh, on a time trial between first and second. Uh, um, I saw uh, another stat, Ulrich, Jan Ulrich, when he won, um, don't know if it, if it was he won the tour, uh, but he won a two, he won once a time trial with three minutes on the second guy, um, but with the distance were longer. So this was unique. This was, um, I mean, I'm not going to say it takes the suspense out of the tour because you know we now we we have Pogacar in a position that he is you know on the back foot and he has to be aggressive and he has to come up with something unusual something special mm -hmm. um, and anyone and, uh, anyone can have a bad day even even Jonas van Gogh well and, that's what and, you hope right I, I think I think that's what Pogaccia is going to hope for yeah and the, the the there's luck involved in the Tour de France there's a lot of stars yeah, of have to align yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. one thing I thought but, was interesting is I I've because he's been working so hard and he's a fan favorite I've been wanting to see Wout van Aert get a win you know, mm. and, and you could even see the look on his face when when Jonas Vinga go cross. He was so happy because thank God it was his yeah. teammate. But I think he was yeah. personally so impressed by that effort. He couldn't yeah. do anything but be excited about it. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, especially especially also in Walt Van Art's case, knowing that last year he was kind of gifted, you know, uh, the time trial win the lot by, by Vingegaard because you know we know that Vingegaard slowed down in the last kilometer uh, on purpose to let Van Aert have the victory. But um, yeah, I mean it's nothing to, not nothing to be said. You know he he lost two minutes fifty one, <laughs> almost three <laughs> minutes on uh, on Vingegaard. So there's nothing to be nothing to be sad about, nothing to be really disappointed. I mean if you lose a time trial with five or ten seconds, you can think yeah you know if I would have done this. If I would have pushed a little bit f faster in that corner or break a little later there, but here, this is just uh, yeah, no discussion. Uh, there there's, the there the seems boss. to be. Uh, I love your thoughts on this. More of a vibe among the current riders. When somebody does a great performance, they're impressed and they want to go congratulate them. They're, yeah, that's more of the vibe with with this generation. Maybe in the this past, community, it, this generation, you the, wouldn't have in done the past, that. There's no way. No you're, way! You're pissed that no, you lost, and you don't want to talk to them. You don't get, no, no, you just want, want to, you're pissed off. You want to calm down, and then maybe in the morning, the day after, you would go and congratulate the guy who had beaten you. You know, yeah. Uh, that's my generation. You know, we were we were pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure Pogacar's pissed off also, but you know what I mean. Especially in in this case, you know, you just have to accept your defeat. You know, there's nothing. That he could have done. There was this debate, you know, and and we 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 were debating amongst uh, the we do members, uh, the we do crew also. Bike change, no bike change. Pogacar uh, made the decision to change the bike. They had done the, the simulations. Um, they decided that it would be better for him to change the bike, especially also because their bike sponsor Colmago, their time trial bikes are heavier, are quite a bit heavier than. Their road bikes. Um, I I don't have the exact numbers, but I I'm tempted to think that 
Cervelo, uh, the back the back brand of uh, Jumbo Visma, is different. That their time trial bikes are close to the weight of the racing bikes. Um, but obviously they had done the test, so they were convinced that that was the best way to do, but with or without the bike change, it, it wouldn't have mattered, you know, just there was, Vingegaard was just the best by far, uh, nothing. I mean, no, no mistakes, no potential mistakes that have been made could have changed the outcome of this time trial. And then what was your takeaway? Uh, I know you stuck around to watch the post interviews with, with Vingegaard mm-hmm. and Pogacar. And, and you you read between the lines on a lot of things. What was your takeaway on their um, uh, post interviews and their, yeah. their state of mind and I, all of that? I think first of all, I mean, it's the first time that I see Vingegaard somewhat excited <laughs> and showing, you know, emotional happiness. He, I think, he was really he surprised himself. I mean, he said, "I he surprised my he, I surprised myself." He, he knew he was strong, but he didn't think that he would be so much better than his big rival. Uh, so um, I think that's genuine. I think that's true. Um, nobody expected this. His team, not his team, not him. Um, uh, so obviously that that puts you on a cloud, him and the team. You know, I mean, they, they their confidence is through the roof now. And it's <laughs> tomorrow they're going to show up at the start of the stage and they're going to boss, want to boss the peloton, right? I mean, they're saying, okay, we're here. What do you guys want to do, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, Bogacar's post-race interview was different. Uh, he's obviously disappointed, but said, you know, that, you know, he hopes he can, t- he can turn it around. He refers to stage five and six, where stage five, he was... He lost a minute where nobody expected that. And the day after, he kind of turned it around. He hopes that that can be the case tomorrow. Um, I think that's a good way of thinking. Uh, and he's, it, hoping for, he's hoping for bad weather, which I think is interesting. He's hoping for he's bad said. weather. <laughs> well, the, the, good thing, the good thing is that it's not going to be hot tomorrow. So that's a good thing. Pogacar typically performs a little worse in in really hot weather Mm. tomorrow it's going to be you know low 20s maybe some showers in the beginning um i mean in the alps uh the high alps that's you know that's different difficult uh so but i think also you know when you're in the position of pogacar you kind of try to find things that you can grasp on to keep your morale up you know okay you, you you need to find positive things because this is a huge defeat, you know. I remember, I remember. Um, oh, I don't remember which. Yeah, two thousand three, for example, we had this the Tour de France with Lance and Ulrich, and the first time trial, uh, Lance had won all, all all the time trials before, and the first time trial, Lance lost. I think actually, if I'm, I'm I would need to check, but I think a minute thirty eight <laughs> on Ulrich. The same as today. I, I'm 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 gonna check that now. But if it's if it's really um if it's a minute 38, let me see the Tour de France of 2003. Uh stage 136. Mm. <laughs> he lost 136. We did not expect that. And I remember sitting with him in the you know, he kept the yellow jersey because he already had an advantage before. But I think it came down to like 15 seconds or something. And I remember going afterwards, you know, like in the within the car and right back and then in the in the room and the morning after breakfast. And you try to find positive things that you can try to find an explanation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that keeps in the, the, case, the, the keeps the morale of your rider. Yeah, they, I mean, you they have to, to find stay hopeful. a logical explanation. And if it's not there, you try to find it. So that's mm-hmm. also what. Pogacar and his team, they're going to try to do, you know, they keep, they need to keep the morale up. They need to find something that they can hold on to and hope. So that's why we heard, we hear, you know, he wants rain, uh, you know, hopefully he can turn it around like, like in in week one, Uh, these little things, you know, and and listen, let's not forget, this is Pogacar and you don't put anything past him. It could be that, he after the rest day he didn't react properly 
you know, we saw him very relaxed and, you know, goofing around, jumping in the pool, mm -hmm. having fun. That's fine. I didn't see any of the, that with Jonas Vingegaard. He was for mm -hmm. sure in his room, cooling down, bike, rest, so-and-so. Um, so, I mean, everybody tries to have a different approach to the rest day. Maybe Pogacar needs this, you know, to relax and, mm -hmm. and it's fine. But he's also going to look, okay, what did I do wrong yesterday? Why was I not, was, why was I not up to the level of him if I have been up to his level and sometimes a little bit better in the days before, uh, you know, and on top of that, there was this, you know, history of they, they had before today, they had eight times head to head and five out of the eight times Pogacar had beaten Vingegaard. So why all of a sudden does this happen? So he's going to try to find uh, an explanation. So if that's the state of mind that tomorrow they show up at the start of this stage, um, yeah, we need to, we need to be, we need to be watching it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. Today's show is brought to you by HVMN and Ketone IQ. They, uh, the folks at HVMN launched the world's first drinkable ketone in 2017. We started talking about it back then. Definitely by 2018, we were talking about it on the show because uh, most of the tele Peloton, 60, 70% are using it on a regular basis. So now, you know, fast forward a handful of years, we're all using it on a daily basis. Here's the bottle that I keep in my fridge. This is 10 shots, so 10 days worth. Of course, you could do more than a shot a day, but I felt like I've got great results out of doing a shot a day over the last few months. It's really helped with mental clarity, energy, not bonking. Uh, kind of got me away from being the, the guy that pounds coffee first thing in the morning until midday. After my ketone shot, I wait. I might have a cup of coffee and I'm good. And so I'm not feeling that caffeine bonk by doing ketone IQ on a daily basis. It's helped me, might help you, especially with the mental side of things. It's helped me with clarity, alertness, and just sustained energy through the day. You can save 30% off your first subscription order at ketone of ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash the move. Again, visit hvmn.com slash the move and subscribe upon checkout for 30% off. Today's show is also brought to you by Ventum. Maybe if you were uh, watching the uh, Move show earlier this morning, you saw Lance's new NS1 in that really cool, bright orange. Uh, I think they were going through the new color schemes and picked one that was one part of our We Do branding, and we do the orange on a lot of stuff. It looks killer. Absolutely killer bike. And you might be surprised at how little you can get into an NS1 or a GS1, the gravel bike. You can get into a GS1 starting at $29.99 uh, with SRAM Apex AXS. And of course, you can customize it all the way throughout the process. And they've got a little, little help or someone to chat with. You can definitely communicate with the people at, at Ventum. I know they were super helpful with me picking out my GS1 based off of my bike fit on my NS1. I just sent them those numbers and they go, this is what you want. You want the medium, large, 90 millimeter stem, 42 bars, you know, all that stuff. They help you out with all of that. It's a great process and, uh, and just a and great customer service. You'll enjoy it. You can get 10% off when you use the code we do at checkout at ventumracing.com slash the move. Today's show is also brought to you by OneSkin, and I am so happy to have discovered this product. Uh, obviously, when you're out on the bike, you're in the sun a lot. Uh, put on top of that for me personally, my daughter does water sports, so I'm always out driving the boat for her and have been for years, and I wasn't doing anything to uh, other than sunscreen to take care of my skin after the fact. And my daughter, who's now 21, got all over me a couple of years ago. And she's like, you, you're not using a moisturizer. You're not taking care of yourself, protect your skin. Now that I've been using one skin for quite a while, I'm like, why didn't I start this earlier? I mean, I could, it would have been so easy just to make it part of your routine. One skin was founded by a team of four female PhD level longevity scientists. They literally spent 15 years of all their experience studying the biology of aging. And part of that process, they discovered OS1, which is a peptide 
The OS1 peptide is proven to target aging cells. It actually reduces the biological age of the skin. If you're not taking care of yourself as part of your daily routine before you go to bed, post ride, you're missing out. Give it a try. Trust me, I've helped. My, my wife has noticed a difference. My daughter is not on me anymore about not taking care of myself. And you can get 15% off at oneskin.co. Co with the code JB2. So JB squared. JB2 is the code. 15% off. And uh, start taking your care of yourself better with one skin. I bet you as a director, you had to know the personalities you were dealing with and make a decision if they really need support right now or they need to be left alone. Like, I'm just guessing because now that I've worked with them so long, like George is a guy that you, you, you want to go talk to and build up and, and, and build these stories for him. Lance is more of a, uh, give him a space, leave him alone more. So no, from what I've mean, seen, no. for, for, when, when, when we worked together, that was not the case. We were close. Um, you know, I always knew, I also knew what, which button I had to push with Lance at which moment. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's super, super important as a coach uh, to know the personality, how, what, what triggers them. Right. What, and, and especially when not to do it and when f to find the moment to do it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if that's the case now in, um, in UAE, you know, we all know that in the first two tours that Ugachar won, that was Alan Piper who was his confidant and uh you know he 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 had like this fatherly older brother relationship with him and that's not there anymore now so i don't know if that's still if he still has this person to uh to go to talk to and uh yeah i mean i'm not going to i'm not going to jinx it for for pogacar but we have to say since Alan Piper is not there anymore, he has not won the tour. If the UAE top people are listening, I would have a look into that. <laughs> Do what's right. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> um, okay, let's take a look at tomorrow. And, and this is what always makes JB Squared so fun is either as a writer or a director, you have so many memories. Yeah, well, first, from first one, oh. one, one, one little thing uh, before tomorrow. Actually, where does the stage start tomorrow? Uh, well, it starts. It starts in 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 Saint Gervais. So anyway, where today's stage finished, Comblou, the town of Comblou, um, I have uh, something to share. Um, when I first moved from a small Belgian team, like a, like it was like a second division team in in the beginning of my professional years, to Lotto, which was the biggest Belgian team, which today. Is still in the race um so but we're talking 1990 so the winter of 1989 uh this was my first experience the team did always like a team building winter camp and we always went to Comblu to this this it's like a little ski resort right and so i have this i found these images here of uh my first uh experience at the lotto uh at the lotto team um riding in the snow mountain biking and um yeah i you know con blue always brings good brings brings back good memories because we had a lot of a lot of fun we built a really nice team there and uh always look back to uh con blue with with great memories uh we can see here in the in the video clip i'm i'm up there with uh claude Criquillon, who was who was the team leader the team uh the, the the team the team lead rider uh, who sadly passed away a few years ago uh, very young he was ex world champion was ex Belgian champion you know, was a great great champion so he's the guy there with me in the front on the mountain bike but uh, wait 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 I'm what and you guys were skiing as well as part of yeah the we camp? did not yeah we <laughs> well skiing <laughs> I see, I just see you holding skis. Yeah, a few a few guys knew how to uh, how to ski Nordic skiing. We didn't do downhill skiing, Nordic skiing because back then you know you were not allowed to to ski because it was too dangerous, and mm. so we did Nordic skiing. But that that actually turned out to be way more dangerous because there was I mean there was maybe five or six guys of us who knew a little bit how to do Nordic skiing, and the rest was just 
crashing and you know it was it was it was just a, a bunch of fun in the snow but don't you know you're referring to cross country skiing don't yeah, cross country of, yeah yeah no yeah cross country yeah don't a lot of cyclists use that as winter training well historically back in the days back in the days uh, apparently no because i've seen more lotto guys on the on the floor than on the skis back <laughs> actually back then Wow. That was fun. It was That's fun. a great fun. clip. That's a great for those yeah. of you listening to it, you'll be able to see that on on YouTube. Uh, a really cool clip. I love when you pull up stuff like that. Okay, now we'll talk about tomorrow, which is also uh, some some memories <laughs> for uh, Johan Bernil mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Anna Cl another yeah. clip. Yeah, but tomorrow, well, first of all, tomorrow stage JB, it's um, what is it, one hundred and sixty eight kilometers. Um, this is the hardest stage of the tour, bar none, 5,400 meters of elevation. Uh, until now, the most we've done is 4,300. So 1,000, 1,100 meters more. Uh, what is that? It's like, it's more than 15,000 feet, right? I think, you know, it's 16, 17,000 feet, I think of elevation in total, 5,400 wow. meters. It's going to be close to 17,000 meters of elevation. How many, 000. how many meters? A thousand? Five thousand, five thousand four, four hundred meters. Yeah, that's 17,716 feet. Wow. Yeah, crazy. <sighs> yeah, okay. in 168 kilometers. So um, this is, this is a stage where so you have a, a cat one climb, another cat one climb, cat two, and then this super long um what is it? Twenty-eight kilometer climb uh, called the La Lose with with is super steep in the last uh, five six kilometers. The highest point of uh, of the tour, I think. Uh, no, actually, the Tour Malais is higher than this, but uh, two thousand three hundred meters very high. But but yeah, I mean the um, the stage tomorrow goes over the Corme de Roselon, the second climb, uh, got one climb, so. Here it says it's 19 kilometers at 6%. Um, 1996, I wrote up that climb, but I'm more known to ride down that climb. <laughs> and actually, uh, this famous crash, which miraculously uh, left me untouched, but you know, I missed this corner, I was in the in the first group with all the favorites, and uh, we went down and I remember Tony Rominger, who I think finished, I don't know, I don't know if he finished second or third in that in that climb, in that tour. Um he kind of got off the road. I had to go with him because I was on the right side. I got on the gravel, hit uh, a, a concrete block and went over down the, the ravine. Uh and here we have this this clip. Um, you know, showing showing how I go down. And then how I come back up. Bound, but at least the sun has come out. There's some very, very difficult descents on the Cormet de Rose. Oh, my goodness me. And that uh, is a rider from Rabobank who has gone clean off into this ravine here on the descent of the Cormet de Roseland. And in fact, it is Johan Brunil who has gone down, but he looks perfectly okay. What a shock. And in fact, can you believe this? This man is just looking for another bike. I doubt whether they'll get the other one back. And there it is, that Johan Brunel who's having a great ride. He was with the main chase group on the mountain. As I watch it again, I've seen this clip many times. As I watch it again, Johan, it's it's very similar to the nasty accident that Remco had. Yeah. Uh, a yeah. hard left-hand turn, a concrete wall barrier, and a big yeah. drop on the other side, which... Uh, yeah. His didn't turn out as well. And it's funny how <laughs> Phil acts like you're just fine and you just look disoriented. I mean, you look ready. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, right. I was fine. I was fine, actually. I mean, the, 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 the crazy, the crazy thing, if you see the, that footage, you know, that those were the, the, the years that we rode, you know, we were so stupid. We, we, we rode without helmets. And I was one of the guys who, I mean, some guys rolled with helmets, but it, it wasn't mandatory. So the majority rolled without the helmet. So we didn't even think about it, you know? So I just go down and I, you know, go over my head and, and do a few rolls. And uh, I get stopped by like bushes, uh, 
low trees. And I come back out and I still have my cycling cap on my hat, on my head. <laughs> I know. And you uh, look I, like you're just like, where's my bike? Give me my bike. Yeah, where's my going. bike? I wanted to go because I was yeah. I was so excited to be with the first guys. You know, there was the yeah. first m- mountain stage in the Alps. This this stage is actually also famous for being the first stage that we saw Miguel Indiran crack, lose time, and that started to lose the tour. This was the first tour that he didn't win after his five consecutive uh, victories. Um, but yeah, um, do you? So uh, it was a long- little, little personal question: Do you do you keep this clip handy on your phone? Because that's yeah. a hell of a story at a cocktail party. The link is in my notes because uh, <laughs> at you know when at gathering sometimes I need to pull it up so I don't need right. to I don't need to go and search for it. It's one of the most iconic mo- moments. Like if you were doing a, a highlight reel from the last fifty years, it would be on that highlight reel. I'm sure of it. It was it was it was a spectacular crash. Uh, luckily, luckily, you know, without too much damage for me. I mean, I do remember though it was so scary. You know, these are the mo- like I remember hitting that concrete block and then go over my handlebars. Mm. And I remember like hanging in the air. I do remember like hanging mm. in the air, which felt like forever. And I said, and I do remember thinking, okay, I'm dead. Wow. I do remember. You that. have a very vivid memory of that. Yeah. Yeah. And then <sighs> next time I know I'm stopped by the, by the bush, I'm inclining, climbing back up and, and getting back on my bike and go, go back down the rest of that downhill crazy again i actually made it back to the front group uh and then at the bottom of the last climb all of a sudden i do remember it sank into me like i could have died and i just i just hit me and i lost i don't know 15 minutes on the last climb i could not pedal anymore ah uh, yeah man. yeah well it, but okay i'm still here so i can still <laughs> tell the story which is nice Yes. Um, let's just do some parting thoughts on how you see things shaking. Let's just focus on tomorrow and not, not the rem- re- the remainder of the tour. Yeah. Um, we're going to, Pogacar is going to have to go on the attack earlier. This can't be the last kilometer scenario, which is very popular right now. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to depend on how he recovers, uh, if he has the legs. Um, I personally think that he he can't go he he can't go on on early in the stage i mean you never know what i mean these guys are you know he's capable of anything this guy but uh, i would honestly if i'm his team director i would recommend wait for the for the last climb it's it's a hell of a climb it's um super super steep and then you know test test vingegaard uh a bit a bit earlier with whatever with six seven kilometers to the top um and and you know if he wants to turn it around uh, and he finds an opening it's not going to be in one stage it would have to be tomorrow a bit and on stage 20 a bit um it's difficult it i i think it's it would take it would take Ugachar being on an amazing day like he was uh on stage six and then Vingegaard having to pay the price after the time trial you know you sometimes it can happen it happens less and less you know but earlier in the earlier days when riders did not train so much on their time trial bike like nowadays you could sometimes see dramatical changes after time trial because these guys went so deep in that aggressive unconventional position that the day after they had an off day and it we might don't, it might surprise it might surprise people who've never done a time trial how differently it pulls on different muscles. Oh yeah, and shocks your system. Yeah, I mean, I've I, I remember I've done time trials back in the days and uh, long time trials, uh, and and it, you, I couldn't walk anymore after that. I mean, your 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 glutes and your hamstrings were so tight that you you, you could hardly walk. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it was also because back then we did not dedicate so much time to training on a time trial bike. Uh, that's all different now. You know, they because we raced more. First of all, we raced more, so there was less time. Now they train a, a lot and they train for what they have to be doing in the race. So none of those guys 
um, hasn't spent a lot of time on on the time. They did. They spend a lot of time on the time trial bike, so mm-hmm. I'm not really worried about that. But you never know. You never know what happens. Okay. Well, uh, on the, if you saw the move uh, this morning, you got to look at Lance's brand new NS1. And Ventum is going to give away a brand new NS1 with their Ventum trivia every day. And this is just for fun. It doesn't cost you anything to play. You can uh, email in your answer to the trivia questions and go into that drawing. We'll give away an NS1 road bike, complete bike on that last day. Yesterday's question or day before, actually, because it was a rest day yesterday. Who holds the longest time span between winning tours? You probably knew that. Um, was it, uh, must have been Copy or Bartali? Bartali? Bartali. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 10 years apart, 1938 and 1948. Wow. Yeah. Um, and no wins in between. No. And how many years did they take off? Well, I mean, obviously the war, uh, at least two world war two is from 40 till 45. So I don't know if there was, uh, I mean, I don't know if the five years, but obviously, you know, that explains the gap of 10 years also. There's a world. (laughs) Well, that tells me if, yeah, if, if there were the gap because of the war, if he was that strong 10 years apart, he might've had, two or three more wins it could have been possible yeah i mean but i mean gino bartoli actually i mean i don't we i think we we talked about him uh, a few years ago on the on the move you know he's uh he was actually i mean after his career got very famous because he shared a secret that during his career he used his bike uh to save uh hundreds and hundreds of jews um so he he was trafficking uh false identity cards from i don't know from from somewhere to to italy and and he he he, he would for, to give them to the jews so they could you know that the, they didn't get the papers he was transporting yeah, paper, papers papers yeah, and- yeah so and he and he and he uh he was hiding them in his bike frame but then they wouldn't question, oh, this is a cyclist he's out just training, yeah exactly, Let, yeah. not bother yeah. with him and- yeah. Wow. And then you said there yeah. was a documentary made about it, I believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. People who want to look it up, it's very interesting. Really amazing, amazing person. Today's question is, and this came up earlier um, on this tour. So if you've been paying attention, you'll know it pretty quickly. Who's the only person to run a sub four mile and complete the tour? A sub four mile. Okay. And if just go research the answer, send it into trivia at ventumracing.com. All right. Good luck. And we've talked about it on JB squared. Yes. It's come up. It's come up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Here's a couple questions for you. Um, this comes from Brian. What are some of the most common mistakes that cyclists make when climbing hills? And I think he's talking about our audience, general cyclists, not, not, not guys in the tour. Yeah, not not to the France uh, specialists. Well, you know, I mean, climbing hills, uh, or more importantly, climbing mountains. I would say, you know, the hills and mountains is different. But uh, I think first of all, um, know your climb, know the climb, know where it starts, know how long it is, and know if it's steep at the beginning or steep at the end. Uh, that's the first thing you need to know. And then secondly. Always, always, always start easy and find your rhythm. Uh, better go easy at the beginning and progressively increase your speed because once you blow up on a climb, it's going to be a long, long, long <laughs> way to the top. Um, I think those are the two most simple pieces of advice I can give. Uh, it's it's always better to start slow and finish fast on a high you're going to, you're going to feel better rather than starting out a little fast and then having to basically creep to the top. And, uh, that's not going to make you feel good. You know, I don't have it in front of me, but I I know a listener wrote in and and, and made an observation about climbing in the modern era. Uh, They, they said, it's interesting how, um, you, you see them always on the hubs with their hands, maybe even sometimes in the drops, the way Pantani would climb. If you go back 20 years, 
It was the guys on the top bars all the time, you know, more, maybe easier to breathe a uh, better position. I'm not sure. Yeah, but there's, There was a lot of things that were done differently. JB, you know, like usually, you know, when you were, that's why for me, for me personally, I, I, I always prefer to be on the hoods because it kind of gave me the, the feeling that my, you have more breathing. You, you can, you open your chest. Right. Uh, but I mean, nowadays I think they're on the hoods uh, because the handlebars are so narrow. Mm. So you look for, and you know, like the hoods are, are obviously wider than here because it's already very narrow. And then if you're on the drops, um, it's still wider than than there. So you know, if you ride with a with a 38 centimeter handlebars or some sometimes even 36 but i would i would think in the tour 38 pogacar is definitely on a 38 vingegaard may be on a 40 uh but you know i think that's also one of the reasons why they're looking to have the biggest stability and actually breathing room because aerodynamics are not that important anymore on the climbs it's uh it, it's funny the uh the handlebar width has changed with this That's you know, modern era and, and crazy. I was talking to uh, uh Dave Bolch on our crew here and he was for Lance's new bike he was having a hard time finding the bars he likes in a 44 today cuz it's oh, trending 44 Lance 44. Is 44 yeah oh wow and yeah, so that's I, I, that's not how it's been trending. You know, 42 it's gonna is come, it's, like, ca- it's gonna come to a point, JB, that handlebars, like wide wider handlebars for road bikes, gonna be like trying to find the bike with uh with rim brakes. You know, is it gonna gonna disappear. Right, right. Or older cassettes that are yeah. you know, fewer gears. Yeah. You just can't get it in that <laughs> but uh that's those are for eBay finds, right? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. okay. Here's another question. Uh this is from Heike. In Canada, I've been a listener since year one. Hopefully this question gets through. I've been wondering for a while on each given race day, how much are the riders spending time on a bike in addition to the stage itself? You can often see them doing warm ups and cool downs on a stationary bike or sometimes hearing they go do a small ride in the morning. How much uh, time does this add up and has it mm-hmm. changed since you guys raced again? That's from Heike. Good question. Yeah. Um, well, you can see obviously uh, that today in today's cycling warm ups and cool downs on home trainers are standard. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, probably some older riders don't do the warm up, especially because in most of those stages, you have five to six to sometimes eight kilometers of neutral. Neutral zone before the, the real start. So the, you, normally they use that as the warm up. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense to warm up and cool down before and after the stage. Um, other than that, they don't spend, especially at the Tour de France, they don't spend a lot more time on the bike. Uh, they wouldn't, I don't think they go for morning rides. We all know that they do ride on the rest days. But, um, yeah, I mean, compared to when, when we were racing, um, nobody, nobody did. If you would have shown up, I mean, I can tell you, if you would have shown up, even in the Lance era, which is, you know, like a generation behind me, um, at the start, and you were on the rollers, and you would have showed up in a normal stage in a skin suit, you would have been the joke of the peloton. I would have said, you, you are, what are you going to do? You're crazy. <laughs> Even if, uh, you, like you see the warm up, uh, especially if it's a stage where, you know, they're going to attack early. Yeah. You know, no, like late, not even in that scenario. Never, never, never. Well, what you had, what you did, we did have, you had guys go, go, you know, a little bit ride up and down, you know, like do a few little sprints maybe on the road, but never on a home trainer. N- 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 was not never even thought about and it wow. makes so much sense yeah <laughs> all right yeah yeah especially the cool down yeah sometimes yeah. these races are a nice warm-up neutral zone but cooling down is finishing yeah. hot uh especially at a mountaintop finish mm-hmm. 
And then we see him putting him in ice baths and the ice yeah, or baths. Sprint, and- or sprinter, sprinters after doing this violent effort, you know, like, and then all of a sudden have to stop. That that's you know that can have a toll on your on your system if you don't ride it out. And you know now oh. they now they obviously do all that. You know, another thing I'll throw in it into into the race because George asked off the show and you brought it up. There's something that they're drinking post race now that's kind of mm-hmm. trending. What is that? Yeah. Well, um, I've also had to ask, but I'm, I've seen it last year and and especially this year. Everybody, everybody is straight after the finish. They have this bottle with this dark purple liquid. Um, apparently, it's uh, tart cherry. So it's um, it's some kind of uh, antioxidant, which you know helps with the recovery. Um, you know, goes against inflammation, uh, basically to 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 enhance the recovery mm. straight away. Maybe when, help, when helps you, flush out lactic acid. When your maybe. body is still pumping blood, you know, and 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 I think it's important that I mean studies will have shown. I'm just talking here out of out of the blue, but it's probably the case that otherwise they would not drink it straight after. You know, when your body's still going full gas, if you have if you ingest uh, the the tart cherry straight after that, that it has the best effect to hmm. enhance the recovery. So. Recovery starts straight when they cross the finish line, basically. Interesting. Well, great question. Um, uh, you sent in there a second ago, Heike. Appreciate it. And if you'd like to send in a question to a future show specifically for Johan, it's JB squared, JB2 at we do dot team. And uh, Johan will be back tomorrow. Yeah. Let's hope we see uh, attacks from the beginning. It would be, and, and I mean, it's, it's bad to say, but I mean, if it would rain, it would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're twisted. Yeah. I mean, all right. We'll, we'll, be, see, we'll, we'll see a nice race. We'll see a nice race for sure. 